Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Roderick Flood, and I'm the provost of Gresham College. And it's a great pleasure for the second time today. Uh, this is uh, our lecture program is expanding um, for the second time today to, to welcome an audience to Gresham College. Um, we have the great pleasure this evening of having somebody who wasn't on the program but who um, volunteered to give us a lecture this evening and we of course accepted with uh, enthusiasm and alacrity um, and it's interesting to see from the perspective of publicizing the college how word of mouth and um, uh, the website can produce uh, the kinds of audience which I'm sure Steve Jones is, is always used to but it's very nice that he's here this evening and of course that he will be lecturing uh, here this evening this will be recorded as usual and therefore will go onto the Gresham website and um, uh, worldwide as our lectures are now going and that's very appropriate because he is somebody with an international reputation emeritus professor of genetics at University College London and of course particular focus of work on evolution and, and in particular on snails He's won many prizes, the Faraday Prize of the Royal Society, the Irwin Prize for Secularist of the Year, and he's very well known, I'm sure to all of you, uh, for his lucid exposition of science, and in particular of genetics and uh, other aspects of his subject. So we're really delighted um, to have him here this evening to talk about incest and folk dancing, two things to be avoided. Steve. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, um, the first line of the United States Army's uh, mule training manual is alleged to say, to gain the animal's attention, first strike it smartly between the ears with a stout stick. And that's why I chose this title, Incest and Folk Dancing. Um, um, I, I say to my students at UCL in their first genetics lecture uh, that I'm a geneticist and my job is to make sex boring, and they look blank at me. But, uh, but after 24 lectures, they know exactly what I mean. Um, and perhaps I'll persuade you that both incest and folk dancing don't necessarily fit into that context. The quote um, comes from that gentleman here, who's, who's Sir Thomas Beecham, okay? He was actually, strangely enough, born not very far away from here. And he once wrote um, that everybody should try anything, everything once except incest and folk dancing. And that's because he hated the music of, of Percy Granger. You remember, he did a lot of English folk music. He also said, incidentally, everything in music has its place, even a brass band, but its place is in the open air and 20 miles away. Okay? <laughs> so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to go light on the folk dancing, but heavy on the incest. Okay. And incest, of course, involves um, mating between two individuals who are related to each other. In the legal sense, uh, perhaps between brothers and sisters, but in the wider sense, it involves every mating that's ever taken place in every species, including ourselves, simply because the simple pressure of numbers means that we are, in fact, all relatives. And to understand what incest means, you need, first of all, to understand what sex is. What, okay, what's, the, what's the difference between males and females, and what does the act of sexual reproduction actually do? Well, everybody thinks they know what maleness and femaleness is. <laughs> and this is an image of what every man, of course, really wants to be. Um, this is, uh, it really is Steve Jones, it's not me, who's listening to that, who really was the Pan Pacific bodybuilding champion. Um, a student once came up to me after showing this and looked very concerned and said, have you not been well, Professor Jones? <laughs> uh, but you'll see this is the image of what maleness is in the popular mind. The guy is extraordinarily muscular, rather dim looking. Um, <laughs> Uh, sort of petulant or expression on his face, angry expression on his face, maybe searching for a, a mate and impressive posing pouch. Um, and that might well summarise what maleness might be. And to some extent, that's accurate. Um, but because if you go elsewhere in the animal world, you find just the same kind of pattern. Here's a male sea elephant or elephant seal, the same thing. And this is a species which is found in, uh, around the Pacific and in the Antarctic. Um, and the males are about five times bigger than the females. Um, only one male in five makes it to be adult because four out of five are killed by the other males as they fight over uh, access to females. And only one male in 20 
or those that are born, actually succeeds in having offspring. And that bit of work was done by a friend of mine with a, a paternity testing system and a long pole and a sharp stick, so he's fairly dead, yeah. Um, and so that what that tells you is that this, in this animal puts a huge amount of effort into being male and attracting females, okay? He's also typically male in the sense that he's not being very intelligent about it because he's wasting his effort on a lot of penguins, which isn't going to do his genetic prospects a great deal of good. Okay, so that's one sense of what maleness means. But actually, um, it's a, there are deeper senses than that. Um, both that sea elephant and Steve Jones, this Steve Jones and that Steve Jones, are filled with this rather noxious chemical that's called testosterone. And uh, the other Steve Jones might possibly, and I don't wish to libel or slander him, um, um, have more than most of us. Okay, um, so that's testosterone, and testosterone is dangerous stuff. It's actually, um, it's, um, it's so it does many things. It makes you male but it does terrible things to your life expectancy. This is the patterns of life and death of men and women, men in blue, women in red. And you can see top right, top left there, that there's a higher mortality rate um, of uh, men than women. Uh, bodybuilders who abuse testosterone, and I'm sure Steve Jones does not do that, uh, bodybuilders who abuse testosterone actually tend to die for very masculine reasons. They die young, in car crashes, through murder, suicide, all those male things. Um, accidental death is common. If you look at the bottom left, you can see even for a five-year-old boy, the death rate uh, through accidents is about twice what it is in women, in a five-year-old girl. A little known but accurate fact of modern science is that men are struck by lightning at three times the rate of women. Now, you may doubt that, but it's actually true. But why should that be? It's because they're being men. They're out on a golf course with a lightning conductor in their hand, um, <laughs> showing off, being masculine, and being frazzled as a result. Men are murdered at 10 times the rate of women. And men actually murder at 10 times the rate of women. Um, rather more surprisingly, maybe, and less familiarly, at the bottom, on the bottom right there, men are much worse at dealing with parasites and infectious diseases than women are because testosterone, testosterone suppresses the immune system. So you might argue, then, that um, that's what maleness is. It's a, uh, it's a system that makes, ma makes males, unlike females, large, angry, violent, and suicidal. Okay? Well, yes, but yes, but because that actually is only a very small part of the whole story. Here's a much more typical female. It turns out that in the animal world as a whole, generally speaking, females are bigger than males. That's true for many, many creatures. And this is perhaps an extreme example. This is a thing called the anglerfish, which for many years was thought to be a, uh, entirely female, thought to be a parthenogen, just to produce uh, just to produce the offspring without males. And then it was discovered that actually there are males. The males are these small um, creatures that are wriggling their way into the affections of the female. And what the male actually does, um, attach it attaches itself to the female, uh, attaches itself to her blood supply, and reduces itself to, a, to being a sack of guts and genitals, okay? What more could any male want, one could argue. Um, and uh, the female is decorated with half a dozen or more males, and she chooses in a way that we simply don't know, uh, one of them to donate sperm, and then she, um, and then she uh, produces offspring in the sexual way. So if size doesn't, doesn't give you the, the clue, maybe genes tell you something about what it means to be male. Well, we all know that men have a particular chromosome, the Y chromosome, uh, which has been read from end to end, and I don't want to bore you with too many details. Um, it turns out to be a very extraordinary chromosome. It's a much reduced and battered and badly damaged version of what was once an X chromosome, the female chromosome. Females have two Xs, males have an X and a much damaged Y. Um, it has an amazing uh, structure. Uh, parts of it have been moved from the X in the recent past. They're called the uh, X transpose the pinkish ones. The most amazing things are those pale, those, those pale blue ones that are called amplicons. Um, and what that is, what they are, are palindromes. Now we all know what a palindrome is. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. If I say that backwards, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama, it reads the same, because it reads the same left to right, right to left. But what these things are, are lengths of DNA, about five million uh, letters long, which uh, read A, G, C, 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 T, T, C, G, C, A, and so on for five million, for two and a half million letters, um, and then immediately switch and read the it read a mirror image um, going the other way. And why that is, too, we have no idea. So you might argue that that's what maleness is. Um, it has to do with having a Y chromosome. But even that doesn't work um, because there are plenty of creatures that manage to be male without having any genetic differences at all. 
Here's a fish that does that, and I'm not obsessed with fish. Um, this is a, a North American fish called a blue finned wrasse, okay? And I guess you can see which one's the male, one on the bottom, the one with the showy tail and the big pectoral fin. And these fish live in groups. What happens is that uh, one male sort of harasses a bunch of a dozen or so females and tries to fight other males off. Usually he doesn't succeed, although you might think he succeeded. Again, DNA testing gives you some rather surprising results. But you can bring them into the lab or into the aquarium, and you can put these animals into a tank and remove the male. Well, understandably, there's a moment of chaos and despair when the male has gone. But after a day or so, one of the females begins to look rather shifty, and she turns into a male. A fully functional male that produces sperm and fertilizes her erstwhile sisters. Um, and that's actually sex determination by embarrassment, by social pressure. <laughs> what actually happens is that the dominant female, the one that's most aggressive, undergoes a hormonal shift that makes a male. That might seem odd, but it's not odd really, because we all know that uh, humans under intense social pressure uh, often undergo quite big, um, quite big um, hormonal shifts, including hormone shifts in the amount of sex hormones. So you don't need genes to be male, okay? Well, what's the true definition of maleness and femaleness? It actually will bring us towards this notion of, in of incest and inbreeding. It turns on differences in the size, oops, and differences in the size of sperm and egg. Uh, we all know that, uh, that sperm are much smaller than eggs. In fact, every time um, a man has sex, he, um, he makes enough sperm to fertilise every woman in Europe, which is a rather terrifying thought. Um, and uh, when I was, writing a, I was writing a book on on men at one time, and there's a good general rule that if you ever write a popular science book with figures or numbers in it, you have to give some analogy or parallel or what have you. Um, and uh, so I wondered, how can I illustrate the uh, amazing uh, abundance of male sex cells compared to female? Well, I turned to the World Health Organization, which tells me, and it certainly wouldn't lie, that there are about um, 50,000 million copulation events in the human population each year. And a simple sum uh, takes you down to about that down to about a million litres of semen every day. Blimey, I thought, that's a lot. Um, the men of the world make a million litres of semen every day. I uh, wrote with a vivid analogy, um, a flow equivalent to that of the River Thames at Westminster. Okay? <laughs> so I thought that was pretty good. Uh, the book got to, pr got to proof stage. And uh, Oscar Wilde once famously said, I do not start writing until I get the proofs. Um, and I thought I'd better just check a few facts now that it's in proof. So I looked at them and I thought, bloody hell, that's a lot of water coming down that river. So, so I wrote to um, Thames Water explaining why I needed the information. <laughs> And there was rather a stunned silence, but after a, after a week or so, there was a letter from the head of Thames Water, which said, Dear Professor Young, thank you for your letter. Uh, we have had many complaints about water quality, but never this <laughs> one. But in, but in fact, you, um, uh, you quite misunderstand the, the flow of the Thames. 50, billion, uh, 50 mil, uh, million litres a day is equivalent not to the Thames at Westminster, but to the Thames a few miles from its source. So it's not that much in terms of volume. But in terms of uh, cells, it's quite astonishing. Um, there are, every second, five births across the world. So that since I started, about two or 3,000 babies have been born across the world. And every second, if you do another sum, you can work out that the men of the world make about 200,000 billion sperm. So for five births, 200,000 billion sperm. Every, sec every second, the women of the world make 400 eggs. Okay? So there's an absolutely spectacular difference in the mating uh, strategies of males and females. And that is the definition of what a female is. She has large, rare sex cells. Males have small and common sex cells. And that's almost, biology is full of exceptions, but that's almost the entire, that's the, un the universal definition. Uh, it isn't always true. There are some very bizarre exceptions, which are, uh, we don't fully understand. There's this huge difference in size um, between human sex cells. Uh, there's a fruit fly which I once worked on, Drosophila bifurca, uh, which, has a, which makes a single sperm every time it has sex. Um, and it's, about, it's, it's uh, longer than its own body. It's about a thousand times longer than human sperm. And that would be equivalent in the human context to a man making a sperm the height of Nelson's column, which is a rather terrifying thought, I think you'd agree. Okay. So that's, 
It turns out that, therefore, that when we look at sex, there are very few general rules which apply across the whole uh, piece. When you come from the top down, you look at men and women, or the way the sex is determined, or the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, sexual strategies of sperm and egg, um, you can break up exceptions everywhere. So what happens if we look not at the biology, but at the arithmetic from the, from, from the bottom up? And the, the, the extraordinary property of sex, really, which is universal and is unexplained by biology, is that it's a system whereby every individual has, about, has two parents. Now, when you think about that, that's extremely surprising. We, every female, every sexual female, every time she reproduces, is forced to copy the genes of another individual, her, her male partner. And she's forced to dilute her efforts by copying those genes. Now, we know that in terms of, um, of evolution, a difference in success of copying genes of a few tenths of 1% can have massive effects over the years. Um, a difference in success or re reduction in success of 50%, or in fact more than 50%, uh, should mean that sex is basically too expensive to get to indulge in. But it's not. It seems to be universal. So there must be some quite powerful force behind it. The force is actually that, uh, the, the mechanism which generates and preserves genetic diversity. Perhaps the most extraordinary finding of the Human Genome Project, which has been much overhyped, but is perhaps finally beginning to do a little bit that's interesting. It hasn't done much so far. But the, the big surprise was to find, and genuinely was a surprise, <coughs> how much genetic variation there is in the human population. As I say to my students, and it's right, if you sequence along the human, uh, sequence along the human genome, about one site in, th in a thousand across the 3,000 million um, uh, elements of the human genome is likely to differ between you and the person next to you. Okay. Now, uh, what sex does is to reshuffle those differences every generation. It turns life into a game of poker rather than a, a lottery. Um, you reshuffle your, your genes when males and females, you make new combinations every generation. Now, that means that everybody in the world, unless you happen to be an identical twin, and as it happens, my mother was an identical twin, although I don't think that's why I became a geneticist, you're different from everybody in the world. Yeah, absolutely. What's more, you're different from every human being who ever has lived or ever will live genetically. And what's even more, every sperm and every egg ever made in human history is different from all the others. And that's what sex does. It maintains massive amounts of genetic diversity. We kind of know why that diversity is there. It has to do with the need to escape, uh, to, uh, to give flexibility and allow uh, animals to evolve rapidly in the face of external pressures from disease, from climate, from starvation and the like. But what sex does is maintain diversity. And if you don't have enough sex, if you don't have sex at all, if you commit incest, then you, as we will see, the amount of diversity begins to go down very quickly, often with rather dire um, results. Okay, now everybody has got two parents, okay, so that must mean, of course, that everybody's got four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and so on. But that isn't true for simple arithmetic reasons. And you can illustrate that again, perhaps with another metaphor from uh, the non-scientific world. Here's a beautiful uh, William Blake drawing of the apocalypse, okay? And we all know about the apocalypse. It's almost on us when we remove, when we, when we, leave, the, when we leave the European Union, no doubt. Um, what the apocalypse consisted of, for Blake and for many believers, was the moment at the end of time, um, which would well, we nobody was sure, but probably sooner rather than later, the end of time when everybody who had ever lived, everybody on earth and everybody who had ever lived, would be gathered together and judged. And a very few, William Blake probably included, would go to heaven, and the rest of you would burn in the eternal fiery pit. Okay? And you can look into the history of that, and it has a clear historical resonance to do with this place here, which is the city of Megiddo in northern Israel which is an ancient city, um, <coughs> which was, um, which was, uh, uh, it's now been, if you haven't been there, it's an extraordinary place. Um, and in 722 BC, uh, in Old Testament times, time of the, of the great battles uh, given in the Book of Kings, uh, in 722 BC, Sargon, who was the head of the Assyrians, uh, raided the place, destroyed it, killed most of, of its inhabitants, and uh, expelled the rest. 
and the, the rest became the 12 lost tribes of Israel. But the, the descendants um, uh, generated the myth that one day they would get back to Megiddon, Armageddon, okay, Megiddo, um, that's where the word comes from, and they would assemble on the plains of Megiddo and they would get their just desserts. They would be judged and found not to be wanting and they'd go to heaven and everybody else would burn. Okay. So what you can do a sum. You can ask how many how many uh, people would be there if that actually happened? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. If we say um, we're, going ba we're going back perhaps 30 or so generations, or more than that, 100 or so generations to that date, um, you get to a sum which is extraordinary. If everybody did have 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on ancestors, a purely sexual population, the world population uh, who would assemble at Megiddo would be a ball of people, solid ball of people, the size of the earth and expanding at the speed of light. Okay. Um, so, and the fact that there are only 6 billion of us rather than trillions of trillions um, suggests actually that we're not as sexual as we think we are. If we define our sex as having two parents, four, 8, 16, we are forced by the simple power of numbers to realize that everybody is the offspring of incest, marriage between relatives, um, at some relatively recent time in the past. You could, the guy who did, who, um, there, there's the son, the guy who discovered that was Francis Galton. Now Francis Galton, as many of you know, was uh, Charles Darwin's cousin. And he wrote a book called Hereditary Genius, which is sometimes hailed as the first textbook of human genetics. And I think that's a bit unreasonable. If you read it, it's a very odd and highly politicized volume. But, uh, but Galton was, a, was a, a genuine genius, there's no question of it. Unlike Darwin, who was both a genius and an effective and thoughtful and cowardly person, Galton was a genius, but he was highly ineffective. He started all kinds of things off, and he never really finished them. But he's an important figure. He more or less founded modern statistics. Um, he was interested overwhelmingly in human quality. And he was convinced that, um, that intelligence and so on ran in families. He, was, he even worked on human beauty. And at UCL, we still have, um, and he left his money to UCL to found the first genetics, human genetics department in the world. At UCL, we still have a little brass counting device, which he held in the palm of his hand and walked around British cities, scoring the local females on a five-point scale from attractive to repulsive. Um, and uh, you know, that might seem to you odd, but it's a measure of quality. And I've tried this with students. People have tried it. Um, they've often tried it, and it's, uh, it works. Everybody agrees, both male and female, who's attractive and who's repulsive in the opposite sex. So it's some measure of quality. But from my point of view, the thing he did that was particularly clever was to work out the consequences of inbreeding. Galton, who was a rich man, uh, not as rich as Darwin, who was worth about £17 million pounds in modern terms when he died, Galton was a rich man, and in the 1880s, um, he used to like to go on walking tours um, in the Italian part, the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland. And uh, it was then a remote and, uh, part of the world. Almost nobody went there. It was poverty-stricken. Some things had changed. Um, and he turned up one year in a village and um, settled in. And he noticed something very odd. Prepare yourself for a crushingly weak joke. He noticed that everybody in that village had the same surname. It might have been, shall we say, spaghetti, okay? So it, it entered his mind, didn't think much of it. Climbed the next day, 20 miles over the mountains to the next isolated village, settled in there, noticed something very odd again. Everybody in that village had the same surname, but it was a different one. It was pasta. Next village, cannelloni. Next village, fartelloni. And until you run out of uh, Italian farinaceous foods. Um, and he, at first he thought, well, that's fascinating. There must be some advantage to being called um, uh, spaghetti in village one and pasta in village two. What can it possibly be? But then he realized this was the result of these populations being, not being completely sexual because they were very small and isolated from each other, isolated from each other. And if he went, he went into, the into the records of each village and he found, to simplify the story, that actually 500 or six uh, years earlier, each village had, had 10 names in it. But every generation, if any male has no sons, uh, he has no daughters, he has da only daughters or no children at all, then his name will disappear. And arbitrarily, one name will take over. And that process is really very powerful. And what we can do, here we've got a system of, uh, of a uh, population with 22, for some random reason, 22 individuals in it. We're talking males here, 22 men in the population. 18 of them 
and the previous generation had, uh, had, had, had sons, 16 in the previous one, and we can go back, 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 until we get back to uh, about uh, 15 or so generations previously, where we have one male who is actually, literally, the Adam of this present population. The first Mr. Spaghetti, there he is. Okay, whoops. Um, where are we here? First, Mr. Spaghetti is the most recent common ancestor, okay, the MRCA as it's known, and all the males at the bottom here are his descendants. Now, so Adam really existed. Adam existed on a global scale, on a village scale and on a global scale, but of course at the time of that most recent common ancestor, there were another 21 men in his village, um, and none of them knew that he, Adam, was going to be the one whose, uh, whose genes were to persi uh, persist, that his surname was going to persist, um, and uh, he himself had no idea that that was true. But certainly, everybody called Spaghetti in the present generation is his descendant. Everybody called Spaghetti in the present generation has his Y chromosome, which passes down the male line. And in fact, everybody in the present generation not only has his Y chromosome, but both men and women in that village have got lots of his other genes too because his genes persisted, whereas uh, others, uh, other, other individuals' genes were less successful. So, in other words, this, this, this village is inbred, okay? And the next village is also inbred, marriage of relatives, but just by chance, a man with a different name took over there. So each of these villages, small and isolated, are, are much less sexual than they might actually be. They're marrying relatives. They're all descent, marrying a descendant of the famous Adam. Of course, inbreeding, the marriage of relatives, used to be very common. Um, even in our own noble royal house, um, there were plenty of, uh, there were plenty of, um, of cousin marriages. Queen Victoria married her cousin. Charles, Dar Char Charles Darwin was very concerned about cousin marriage because he himself had married his cousin um, and he actually wrote to Galton asking whether this was going to cause any problems. And um, uh, Galton thought it might, Darwin being, being a genius, which he, which he certainly was, then went on to study the problem. And uh, this is slightly off the point, but it shows what the power of what Darwin did. He was interested in the effects of cousin marriage on human populations, on human families. What did he do? He went and worked on flowers. And only with the theory of evolution did it become possible even to contemplate that work on flowers would be relevant to work on humans. But Darwin did that, and he wrote a couple of rather indigestible books on self and cross-fertilization in plants, in which he suggested that self-fertilization, which is uh, in plants which are simultaneously male and female, is what Woody Allen used to call um, sex with somebody you really love, yourself, okay? Um, um, self-fertilization, he thought, was generally a bad thing, so he got very worried about the effects on health. Um, and in some senses, the same is true, in, um, as we'll see, for a, the very close inbreeding in humans. Um, sometimes the inbreeding in humans goes to an extreme. Uh, Queen Victoria was pretty, uh, was pretty um, um, uh, fecund. She had uh, nine children, and many of them married their cousins. Um, if you were to draw a pedigree, if you, of, uh, that, of, that, of, of the modern royal family, you would find that many members of European royal families traced descent from Victoria. She became known as the grandmother of Europe. Um, every single member of every European royal family tra traces, uh, traces descent from somebody called John Friso, who was, I think, a Swede who lived in the 18th century. So they're reasonably inbred, okay? But that has nothing compared to what used to happen a few hundred years ago. Here are the Bourbons, the famously um, eccentric and mad Bourbons, um, and these are the numbers of ancestors that they had at uh, different times in the past. As I said, if, there, if the Bourbons had been a purely sexual outbreeding population, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, at, uh, at uh, seven generations, they should have had, each one of them, 128 ancestors. Well, you'll see that Alfonso XII, the King of Spain, instead of having 128 ancestors seven generations back, only had eight. And that's pretty impressive, okay. Um, uh, uh, interestingly enough, he married Victoria, Victoria's granddaughter, whose name was also uh, Victoria, and she, Victoria's granddaughter, brought the blood disease um, um, haemophilia into the Spanish royal family, so uh, that really didn't work out particularly well. But there was a huge amount of inbreeding, and you find that if you go further back into his ancestry. If you draw the pedigree of an inbred family, the signature of inbreeding, of asexual or less than sexual reproduction, 
is to find loops in the pedigree. And here's the pedigree, different, different horizontal lines of different generations, the vertical lines are lines of descent, and you can see loop after loop after loop. Uh, and that means that this, this, this mating was actually pretty damn, um, pretty damn um, um, uh, inbred. If you go further back again, you find that things go uh, even more extreme. Uh, Tutankhamun's uh, body was, was uh, DNA was looked at um, not long ago. Um, it turned out that it was very clear that he'd had sex with his sister because uh, she, his sister, had been killed after he died. She was pregnant, and the children could only have been two, the two of them's offspring. Um, he himself was almost certainly the offspring of a brother-sister mating. And this comes from the belief which the Egyptian pharaohs had, and no doubt the British royal family has in mitigated form, that they are actually the bloodline of a god. Okay, the, 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 the um, uh, Tutankhamun thought that they were gods. And if you're a god, you don't want some non-blue blood getting in there. But if you look at Tutankhamun's skeleton, he had um, real problems. He had severe skeletal uh, dis deformity, uh, and he, with the numerous walking sticks and so on, were found in uh, were found in his in his uh, in his uh, grave. So we can we might uh, deplore this fact, um, but there's no doubt that close inbreeding causes lots and lots of problems. Um, let's, 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 let's just miss that out. Uh, Darwin himself found that. Darwin was a keen. Uh, was very keen on dogs. Okay, he had a dog of his own. He wrote some. Uh, he wrote a, a wonderful book called *The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Other Animals*, which was incidentally the first ever book to have photographs in it. Not many people know that. In which he showed pictures of people's faces when they were frightened or happy or sad. Also pictures of dogs' faces when they were growling or or terrified, and showed parallels between them. But Darwin was very keen on dogs, and he was particularly keen on bulldogs. He had a bulldog of his own, and I'm not a great living as I do in Camden Town, I'm not a great dog lover, I can assure you, for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, that's a picture of the bulldog in 1817. And the bulldog um, uh, was bred for a particular purpose, which was for bull baiting. Okay, very cruel, that's why it was there. And uh, it had to be fierce, which it certainly is. It had to be able to uh, leap up, which it has strong, muscly legs, and attach itself to the bull's face, often, and hold on. Okay? That's why it has this undershot jaw, so it can grab onto the bull's nose and hold on, not be shaken off by this poor, terrified bull. Well, that's, it was a handsome-looking animal in 1817. People breed bulldogs, and uh, dog breeders, then and now, behave in the most outrageously um, irresponsible fashion, because they frequently not only mate brothers and sisters together, in order to get, uh, to get the, the, op the allegedly optimal offspring. But a very common pattern is for a very successful male dog to be mated to his daughters, his granddaughters, his great-granddaughters over several generations in the hope of getting a prize at Crufts. This is the animal which won the prize at Crufts in 2008. And that really is a tragedy. You may, there, there was a program just after that on the BBC, some of you may have seen, which I played a small part in, called Pedigree Dogs Exposed, which led to a huge row um, that, that BBC would no longer co cover crafts. But that's what happens if you inbreed, okay, to an extreme extent. Um, now, what, so we, therefore, we really need to know how, inbreed, how inbred we each are um, and how, what effects that has. If you begin to work out the possible um, relatedness of each one of us, um, uh, I can actually illustrate how likely to, we are to be inbred by asking you to shake hands with the person next to you, if you can stand it, okay? Feel free to do so. <laughs> and I have just, with a 50% probability, I have just introduced you to your sixth cousin, okay? <laughs> um, and that's the average degree of relatedness. To get back to a, to get back to a sixth cousin who might have lived um, uh, in the time of, of, of Darwin, um, uh, you, you, to get back to a probable sixth cousin with a 50% chance of accuracy, you only have to go back to about Darwin's day. If you were to go back to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the time of, 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 of Megiddo, about 3,000 years. In fact, it turns out that everybody in the world, from Papua New Guinea to Australia to China to North America to Africa, is descended from one individual uh, who lived about 3,000 years ago. Uh, we don't know who that was, of course. We don't know where they were, uh, but they are, we're all descended from that individual. So we are all descended um, from uh, more closely inbred than we actually think. So what effect does that have 
on human health? How can we, first of all, how can we measure it? And secondly, um, what, the, what effects might it have on health? Well, clearly, you, most people, unless you happen to be either divine or a god, um, most people don't keep pedig detailed pedigrees, so you don't know how to do it. But actually, Darwin then has another good idea, showing how clever he was. He and his son, George Darwin, were interested in the effects of inbreeding, not just in flowers, but on humans. And George Darwin had uh, a, 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 a clever notion. He, were, he wrote to the... Um, the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge, and he asked them how many cousins there were in their colleges, okay? um, how many people in the college uh, were cousins. And of course in those aristocratic and exclusive days, no longer true, needless to say, in Oxford and Cambridge, um, at least, uh, plenty of them were cousins because they came from aristocratic families who tended to marry their relatives. And then he, then he asked the members of the boat race crews of each college, uh, whether they were cousins or not, and it turned out that if you were in the, in the college boat, you were less likely to be a cousin, in other words, the offspring of a, uh, of a, a closely inbred marriage, than if you were just some nerd who went to the library every day um, and uh, were not at all athletic. So that was some hint, not a very scientific hint, um, that uh, cousin marriage was bad for you. It was finally ruined by the fact that actually St John's College, Cambridge, cheated and told him completely false figures, and when you took that out, the whole thing fell apart. So that didn't work. Um, that didn't work. But then Darwin had another typically brilliant idea. He realised, as had Galton, that a quite a good way of measuring, uh, of measuring cousin marriage, measuring relatedness, is to ask how often, how many names are there in a particular population in the relation, in relation to the number of people. Okay, and that's very clever because this is the Italian hill village story on a large scale. And it's obvious when you think about it, if you go to somewhere like Oslo, which is a pretty homogeneous population, uh, you'll find that in the phone book there are, on the average, something like 80 uh, copies of every name on the average over the, over the population. If you go to New York, there are, which is a fantastically outbred population, there are on the average two repeats of every name, which means there are plenty of names which are just there once. And of course, uh, New York is a much more outbred population, a much more mixed population than are the populations of Scandinavia. So this is a process um, of looking at names. And it turns out there's a whole new science, really, of name, of uh, looking at names. And there's an even more powerful method of doing it, which is called isonomy, having the same name. And you, to, to study that, you go to the marriage records of places like Finland or Croatia or many Catholic countries, and you ask how often do people with the same surname get married? Now, that doesn't work very well in sort of plebeian names like Jones, because the name Jones has originated hundreds of times, just means son of John. But it's better with a name like Attenborough, shall we say, if you're both called Attenborough, it's quite likely that you're both descended from an Attenborough who lived not that long ago, um, and hence, although you might not know it, you might actually be, um, relati you might be relatively, um, you might be relatively closely related. And the figures on names are quite remarkable. Um, the average time depth of a Welsh name, most Welsh names came into being only about 300 years ago, when the English invaders insisted that we stopped at the old system where you called yourself after your father, your grandfather, and the like, so that everybody who was the son of John became a Jones, everybody, others who were the son of John became an Evans, because there's no J in Welsh, so it's Evan, Evans, uh, others who were sons of John became a Jenkins, John's kin, um, so, you know, there are not many names in Wales. England has a time depth of 700 years, Japan only 150 years, because they only came in 150 years ago. And China, the average time depth is 5,000 years, okay? And you can see the power of inbreeding, because the depth, time depth, the longer you go back, the more likely you are to find um, patterns of shared relatedness. And in China, a, a fifth of the population, which means about 300 million people, share three family names. In Britain, the average number of carriers of a particular surname is 17. Okay, in in France the uh, sorry it's, it's 28. In France it's uh, it's uh, in France it's 17. In Ireland it's 63, and in China it's 75,000. Okay, and that's because the further back you go with these ancient surnames, the more likely you are to converge on a shared ancestor. Now it turns out <coughs> that actually this science of isonomy um, is overlapping with the science of genetics, because what we can now do, of course is to ask about descent using DNA. And we can particularly ask about descent 
using the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome, the male chromosome, passed from father to son to grandson, just like the Western system of surnames, has been read from end to end, and there's a whole industry, of which we have some of my colleagues are involved in, of looking at individual differences in patterns of Y chromosome diversity from place to place. And a few years ago, somebody had the bright idea of saying, OK, well, names and Y chromosomes are pretty much the same. Why don't we write to people with particular names, surnames, and look at their Y chromosomes? And who is the obvious people to, to look at? The obvious uh, people to look at were the Attenboroughs. Okay? So David gave some, and his son, who's in Australia, gave some. And various other Attenboroughs wrote in. Um, and they compared them with a bunch of plebs known as the Smiths. Okay? And the Smiths, of course, the name Smith just means a worker in iron. And that's arisen again and again. And this, these are family trees of the Y chromosomes of the Smiths. Okay? And you can make kind of a, uh, you make the family tree by asking how similar different Ys are and asking how many errors, how many changes there would have to be from one to the next. And you can see on, in, in the top B there, the Smiths, there are 560,000 Smiths in Britain and they're a highly bastardised lot. Okay? There are some groups of rather similar Smiths, but they're not particularly homogeneous. Look at the Attenboroughs con in contrast. There are 932 Attenboroughs in Britain, um, and you can see that almost every, almost all of them share the same Y chromosome. So they almost all descend from one individual called Attenborough, who probably lived in the Middle Ages near a fort, Attenberg, possibly in the possibly in the English Midlands. Okay, so the Attenboroughs show that surnames actually tell you a lot about genuine patterns of genetic relatedness, and you can draw a map of surname diversity, for example, in Britain, and I'll come back to this in the end. The warmer the colour, the more names in relation to population size. Okay? Now, this was done at UCLI for eccentric reasons. They weighted it by population size, which is rather annoying. Um, but you'll see that Wales is pretty cool. Okay? There aren't many names there, partly because they're new. Uh, somewhere like Cambridge um, and Oxford are relatively inbred in more than one sense of the word. Um, London is enormously diverse and is becoming more so. Um, Scotland is fairly inbred. Um, if you look right at the top of the map there, you'll see the Orkneys and the Shetlands. And you'll see there's, uh, that there are really very few surnames in those places. And I'll come back to them at the end of the talk. So the surname story does actually tell, tell you something quite interesting about, um, about um, patterns of relatedness. So what are the patterns of relatedness and inbreeding and mar marriage across, not just in Britain, but across the globe? Well, in fact, it's actually really pretty common. Um, you can draw a map of what's called consanguinity, the incidence of marriages closer than second cousins. Many of these marriages are cousin marriages. Some of them are even closer than cousin marriages. A very common pattern in southern India and parts of the Arab world is uh, uncle-niece marriage, and that's closer genetically. You marry your brother's daughter. It's really quite common. And you'll see that the brighter red the colour, the higher the extent of consanguinity, consanguinity. And in some places, such as bits of parts of Pakistan and in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, more than half of all marriages of this kind. And indeed, in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, the overall pattern of relatedness of two, average, two Saudis, taken at random, is of equivalent to being first cousins once removed. In other words, they're equivalent to being related as they are to their parents' cousins. And that's pretty damn close, OK? And it, um, that has, without question, um, uh, some, kind of, some kinds of effects. Where are we here? OK. Um, some, without question, has health effects. Now, the place where you can see those effects most strikingly is, uh, strangely enough, in an unexpected part of the world, which is Finland. And Finland, which now is an affluent country with an excellent health system, uh, socially very stable, for many years was on the edge of the known globe. Genetically, the Finns are not like other Scandinavians. They're much more like Siberians. They came across the northern part of Russia. And Finland has 33 in inherited diseases which are found nowhere else in the world. Okay? And they're what we call recessives. In order to show the effects, you need to have two copies of the damaged gene. And um, the, Finland has become a, na a natural genetic laboratory. And here's a young girl here, um, uh, who's certain, unfortunately certainly dead now. I took, a, took the photograph about 10 years ago, a bit more now, um, uh, with a disease that's called variant late infant, infantile neurolipofuscoidosis. 
and it's not going to be in the exam. The students always panic when I say that. Um, uh, which is a nervous degenerative disease, a bit like Tay-Sachs disease, but nothing can be done about it. The nervous system basically poisons itself and children die at an early age. And there's her dad, there she is. And if you look at the map on the left there, VLINCL, you can see it's concentrated in one part of Finland that's called Austro-Bosnia. Okay? Now in the old days, and to some extent still today, Finland consisted of a few islands of people surrounded by a sea of trees. People lived in tiny isolated villages where they never um, moved away. And Finland had extremely good family records through the Lutheran Church. And here are the pedigrees of some of those cases of VLI and CL. Um, and here's at the bottom there, the, what, what, the, the horizontal lines are the generations, the verticals are uh, from one generation to the next. Circles are females, squares are males, and blacked in means that you've got the disease. And at the bottom, um, on the right there, the, the young lady who's blacked in, um, she has the disease, okay, which means her parents, and you saw her dad, uh, must have carried one copy each. And you can find other examples, and it turns out that nearly, nearly all the examples uh, descend from one man who lived in about 1650. And he must have carried a single copy of the gene. And if you look, you'll see there are several loops in that pedigree um, because people are living close together. And finally, those two copies which had come down the generations inevitably came together in that unfortunate young girl and had somebody else in the same generation. In A, we have another case where we can't link it to that man, but that's simply because the information isn't there. I'm sure if we had the information, we'd link it to that chap there. So that's what inbreeding does. It certainly does increase the amount of... Um, of, of, um, of specific genetic disease. But it does more than that because if you, you, can, you can ask the question, there are some more inbreeding loops, there are inbreeding, plenty of inbreeding loops in Finland. But you can ask a wider question, even if you haven't got the pedigrees, which generally we don't have in human families, you can simply ask people, you know, are you, are you related to the person you married? Are you the offspring of a cousin marriage? And the answer is the effect is not small. Um, here's the patterns of childhood mortality and morbidity in the, in the general British population, North European population, and in British Pakistanis, in particular the population of Bradford, um, which consists of a highly inbred population, largely because there's strong social pressure, less now, but certainly 10 years ago there was, strong social pressure on young people in Bradford to marry a cousin in Pakistan who would then come and join the family. Okay? And you can see that for congenital malformation, like cleft lip, uh, for disabilities of different kinds, for genetic disease, early death, there's about a doubling in overall genetic damage in these inbred populations compared to outbred populations. So people have got really more and more interested in, in, in what inbreeding can do. And we're beginning to find some really quite striking effects of inbreeding, which is beginning to cause a certain amount of... Let's miss that bit out. Okay. Um, how can we measure it? Okay. What we can do is we can treat DNA as if it's a surname. Now, Y chromosomes are surnames because they don't reshuffle and break up every generation. Now, we all know that what sex does is to break up and reshuffle the genetic cards each generation. Certainly, if the genes you're interested in are on different chromosomes, they will rearrange automatically uh, at random when each sperm or egg is made. But if the genes involved are on the same chromosome and a long way apart, the chromosome itself will break up and you'll have this rearrangement pattern. But if you look over short lengths of DNA, and by that I mean some millions of DNA bases, this breaking up process will happen only very rarely. So for much of the time, blocks of DNA will be passed down the generations, okay, without being reshuffled. Um, now, I, I talked about this isonomy game, marrying somebody with the same name. And here we have a marriage of two Attenboroughs, okay, um, who've got their ten letter or whatever it is name. They've both got the same name. You can line the two names up together and there's a perfect match. They must descend from the same individual. But you can do the same with DNA. And here's at the bottom, we have about a ten or so length of DNA, which you take from somebody at random. And it turns out that for this individual, he or she, has got exactly the same copies of, um, of, of the uh, genetic sequence along those ten letters. But we're not talking about ten letters, we're talking about a million letters. Now, just to use the, just to use the, uh, just to use the technical language, this is called a run of homozygosity, or ROH. 
doesn't mean Royal Opera House to geneticists, it means Royal Opera House to And what you can do is to go into populations easily with the technology that we've got today. And you can get some people and grind them up, or put it another way, get them to spit into a tube, and simply ask, how often do you find great copies, numbers of copies, of great, the incidence of doubled up copies of DNA of particular lengths, okay? And this will tell you with some accuracy how inbred, how much inbreeding there has been in that population over time. Well, the work was first done five, six years ago now, and somewhere, at first sight, perhaps slightly surprising, in Croatia, okay? And oddly enough, I did my PhD in the dawn of time in Croatia. As I often say, I'm one of the um, world's top six experts in the genetics of snails, and the other five agree. Um, and I, I did the snails of Croatia, and I had a lot of fun out of it, but that's another story, without realizing there was a much more interesting human story just, just waiting to be told. And now it's been told. Well, these islands are, like many places in the Balkans, uh, very resistant to people coming in. Uh, they're very closed communities, and they've got very, very good family records. Well, I'll talk you through this rather complicated slide. Let's just look at the right, where it says more than 10, okay? That more than 10 means the proportion of the population that has doubled up copies of DNA, same sequence, same genetic surname, more than 10 million DNA bases long. And that's pretty, that's pretty long, okay? And let's look at the right hand, the more than 10 segment. The endogamous Dalmatian, that means Dalmatians people on the islands who married somebody else from the islands, something like 30% of the population has got a doubled up segment of DNA. If you look at uh, mixed Dalmatian, that's the blue one, number three or so, um, it's much less. Um, interestingly enough, if you look at the second one, the pink one, they're endogamous Orcadians, and Orcadians are people who come from Orkney. And much to everybody's surprise, it turns out the population of Orkney is almost as inbred as the population of these remote islands. And they also have very few surnames. Then if you move to Europe as a whole, or Scotland, or England, um, there's very few people with these huge numbers of uh, doubled up copies of DNA. So now what we can do, we can actually, um, in Croatia, that actually fits very well. The figures you get from those... Um, from those experiments fit almost precisely the figures that come from the marriage records, which is one of the reasons why they chose it. But what we can do now is measure the level of inbreeding in any population or any individual with an automatic test that would take you less than a take you a morning. Okay? Simply ask with a chip how many runs of homozygosity have you got, and we will tell you how inbreeding you are, how inbred you are. And it turns out then actually, um, um, it can have really severe effects. Here's a case of extreme inbreeding. This is the child of incest, brother-sister mating, and um, uh, the, the blacked in green sections are runs of homozygosity, okay? And they're huge. They're hundreds of millions of DNA bases long, okay? Uh, and that's not surprising because he, the, the, his parents were, were brothers and sisters. And this child is very severely compromised and lives in a children's home will never, never manage to make a living, never manage to live in the real world. It's got a severe mental disorder. But that's an extreme case, and we know from the dis dysfunctional family that he has the problem. But what can you do? You can go into various kinds of disease, and you can ask, what's the incidence of runs of homo homozygosity in people with the disease versus people without the disease? And this is a, uh, this is a colon cancer um, at the top um, versus controls, people without colon cancer, at the bottom. And I think you'll see that the proportion of people with large numbers of, um, of, of, of runs of homozygosity, black blobs, um, in the cancer patients is much higher than that in the general population. And that's tr true of a number of the conditions. This is schizophrenia. Well, that's probably a bit too complicated, that one. This one. Um, early onset Parkinson's disease, just the same. Um, as you, if you, the more runs of homozygosity you've got, the more likely you are to get Parkinson's disease. Um, there's even an increase in infections rate, infection rates with homozygosity. So that really, tell, that really tells you that this inbreeding pattern is really important. And it's now an important, is becoming, will become, this is all very new in the last year or so, will become an, a standard diagnostic tool in many conditions, I'm sure. So let me end up by asking, well, what's the future? What's, when we get to Armageddon, what are we going to look like? Well, the answer is really that we're going to look quite different because of this wonderful eugenical tool known as the 747, okay? Because no longer do we behave like the Finns. 
the Finns now come to UCL even and find themselves a mate from China, and that's by no means unknown. Um, and people are no longer marrying the boy or the girl next door because they've got no choice. Um, you can see that in America. If you look at uh, DNA samples, including uh, preserved DNA samples, over people born um, in 1900 versus those born in 2000, you'll see a dramatic decrease in the uh, incidence of runs of homozygosity. So we're getting more and more outbred. But you don't need technology. You can do it with surnames. Here is my family name, the Joneses, okay, a Welsh name. And in 1881, um, in 1881, as you will see, um, uh, we were combined, safely confined behind the electric fence on Offa's Dyke, and we were, all in, we were all in West Wales, okay? By 1998, the Joneses were on the march, okay? You have to make a 1% of the population to get onto this map. Uh, we haven't, we've got to Oxford, but we haven't got to Cambridge, but we are also in yes. London, okay? And that's happening everywhere, and you can see that everywhere. People are absolutely on the move. So I think, really, um, what, we're facing, what we're seeing is a new era of human evolution, which is the sort of triumph of the mongrels. As incest disappears then, as a result, we will have no choice but to take up folk dancing. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Steve, for a fascinating lecture. Um, we do have about 10 minutes, I think, for questions. And uh, let me begin. Um, the pattern that you've just described could, could it possibly explain the supposed increase in human intelligence? It's been suggested that. It's possible. I mean, it, 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 the trouble is it, it fright, it's frightfully easy to make ad hoc yeah. hypotheses about human evolution. It has been suggested. Um, it's also been suggested that it's, uh, it's, respons it's responsible for improvements in human height and all this kind of stuff. And there may be some truth in it, but it's very rather difficult to test. What's much more important in both height and intelligence, of course, is the environment, I tend to forget. And the fact that there's certainly gene genetic variation behind human, human height diversity and human IQ diversity, there's no question that's true. Well, we haven't found the genes. Um, that doesn't alter the fact that, uh, that the environment is involved. You know, the, the classic case is the difference in height between the people of, the, between the people of North Korea and South Korea, mm. which is five inches. Yeah. Now, genetically, these people are the same, but the people in North Korea are starving, the people in South Korea are eating well. Yeah. So um, it could be true, but I'm not convinced there's much evidence that it is. Right. Any other questions? Everybody's is it going to be in the side. exam? <laughs> Yes, over, over there. Sorry, you need a microphone, yeah. Thank you. So I come from Bangladesh, so um, up, up until very, very recently, in fact, even now, people are living in very limited mobility, very close, sort of, you know, I'm probably very inbred. Um, you freak me out about the Finns, but would it be ideal for me to have offspring with a Finnish guy? What are the pros and cons of that? <laughs> Uh, if you'd been to Finland, you might think twice. Actually. Um, <laughs> Finland, amazingly enough, has the highest murder rate in Europe. It's hard to believe. They fight with knives when they're drunk. Um, but, um, well, actually, that, that actually is, is, is not an unserious question. I mean, uh, to oversimplify the issue, um, uh, I think, taking the example of the, common, the commonest single gene genetic disorder in European populations, um, which is as most of us know, the, the, the disease cystic fibrosis, okay, which is a very nasty condition which can be controlled, but you, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't want to have it. You certainly can't cure it. Okay? And to have it, you have to have two copies. So you sometimes, and it certainly happens, you get a, a woman, shall we say, from a family in which there is a history of cystic fibrosis who is very concerned about it, wants to be sure that she isn't going to have a child with cystic fibrosis. What's the best advice you could give her? Marry a Nigerian. Because there's no cystic fibrosis in Nigeria, so her kids are bound to be okay. In Nigeria, there's sickle cell disease, which most of us have heard of, which is a bit the same. The advice to a Nigerian is marry somebody from Abristwith, because there's no sickle cell disease in Abristwith. Um, so in that sense, I think there's a, a case to be made. But oddly enough, uh, Bittles, the guy, John Bittles, who did much of that consanguinity stuff, he spent a long time asking the question with huge data sets, okay, let's ask, what's the relative health 
in India, actually, and in Pakistan, of the children of, um, of cousin marriages versus non-cousin marriages. And he was baffled to find that the children of cousin marriages were better off and healthier than the children of non-cousin marriages. It just doesn't fit, okay? But then, and he's a very capable bloke, um, and he had Indian collaborators, um, and so he looked more deeply into it, and it turned out it was entirely due to social pressures, because you marry your cousin if you have some wealth in the family and you want to bring the dowry in to keep it in the family. And if you've got wealth in the family, your kids are going to be better treated. If you're an untouchable, you've got no wealth, nobody cares who you marry, so, and you're poor and your kids are in poor condition. So I, I say with some passion, actually, that gen for most people, genetics is the great irrelevance. I would, if I were you, I would depend on the healing power of lust. <laughs> <laughs> That isn't always true. I mean, there are particular families, you know, for example, Ashkenazi Jewish families in North London where there's a high incidence of a particular um, nervous disease, where this really is an issue. And actually, people are careful about their marriage patterns and have succeeded in really uh, ensuring that none of the kids with this disease are born. So for some people, it's important, but for the mass people, it's just irrelevant. While the microphone's coming up, you should note, of course, that the other good example, apart from the British royal family of cousin marriage, is the Rothschilds and the, Absolutely. the big Jewish banking families of the 19th century. That's for right. Exactly for the reasons you were talking for, about. For five before. generations, every Rothschild married his own husband, her cousin. Yeah. Uh, and that, again, was overtly or covertly an attempt to keep the money in the family. Yeah. There's a way, there's a, I'll, I'll stop rambling in a second. A way you can measure the effect is to ask is to measure what's called the marriage distance. How far apart was the birthplace of yourself and your partner versus that of your mother and your father, your mother's mother and your mother's father, and so on. And <clears throat> generally speaking, you'll find an enormous increase over the recent years. Myself and my wife were born 3,000 miles apart because she was born in New York and was born in West Wales. My parents were born three miles apart, and one very rude student muttered one year, and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> Your comments are more interesting than my question. Um, does this mean that the rare genetic disorders will eventually disappear altogether? No. Uh, uh, what it means is that in time, this is already happening, that the rare genetic disorders in Finland, shall we say, they will go away for a time, as Finns no longer marry the by the girl next door, or they go to America, some of them, many of them do, and they travel. They will go away in the so next generation, maybe the next generation. But the iron logic of genetics tells us when we get back to some kind of global new equilibrium, um, they will come back again. The genes haven't gone, the genes themselves haven't got away. In time, they will come back and re-meet. But by then, we're all fried in a nuclear Armageddon anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yes, one question. Uh, sir, at, at what time in the past, in the, during the development of man, was the brain large enough to be progressive, which distinguishes us uh, as life forms from every other life form on Earth? Well, uh, people, people argue about that. Uh, and the, the brain got pretty big with Homo erectus, which we're talking about four million years ago or so. Okay, um, it was pretty big then. Um, the interesting thing is that when, and if, if you go back to places, people like um, Australopithecus, uh, Lucy, um, her, her brain was small, okay? And we don't quite know why the human brain got, began to get big. Many people would say it has to do with standing up. Of course, once you stand up, you can, you can scan the horizon, you can travel further and that kind of stuff. But it's speculative. But what's interesting is that the, the human brain, the modern brain, Homo sapiens, the species to which many of us claim to belong, pause for laughter, um, is, hasn't got any bigger since the days of uh, we appeared, when we first appeared on Earth. In fact, if anything, it's got something slightly smaller, it's certainly smaller than, than the Neanderthal brain. That's only because the Neanderthals were big and clumsy and horrible. Okay. So I have the... I mean, it's about the same size as the Cro-Magnon early modern human brain. Now, I have the dubious privilege, as I mentioned, of um, living in Camden Town. And if a Cro-Magnon man were to come and sit next to me on the tube, I uh, probably wouldn't notice. He might be covered in skins and grunting, but this is Camden Town. <laughs> okay. um, so, that, so that physically, 
and in terms of brain size included, he has, has not, I, we have not changed compared to him. But mentally, we have changed entirely. So I think that human evolution has overwhelmingly been in, in the functioning of the brain rather than the structure of the brain. So I would suggest that insofar as you can define what progress means, I think it probably began with the human species. the last question down the front here. Uh, apologies if I misunderstood what you said, but I think you, you said that um, the whole of humankind could be traced back to an ancestor from Armageddon, which is only yeah. a matter of a few thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I was confused by that. I mean, surely in that time scale, sort of isolated communities are already developed around the world. Well, I so, mean, so, so how does that... That, that, that calculation, I mean, it's a fairly recent paper, which is lots of hand-waving in it, okay? It, de it depends on the amount of migration, the length of uh, generations, the relative success of males and females, and very often males are far fewer males mate than females mate, because some males have many mates, the sizes of populations. So there's an awful, the rate of mutation, which, and that's, they use the rate of mutation to try and work out the timing. Um, so it's full of guesswork. But you do quite quickly get back to that date of about 3000 BC for the universal ancestor of everybody. The universal ancestor of almost every Briton probably lived in about 1066. And you only need one person to, you know, but, I mean, the classic case, are, there's, a, there's a family in um, Yorkshire called the Revises, okay? And the Revises are named after Rivo Abbey. So it's a fine Yorkshire name. None, no bloody foreigners here, mate. Okay, so uh, if you look at the Revises, it turns out they've got an African Y chromosome. Why is that? Because at some time, 500 years ago, as is by no means uncommon, an African, probably not a slave, actually, probably some kind of uh, representative or merchant, came to, uh, to Britain, married into the Revis family. His genes have, in some sense, has been diluted away. But by virtue of his, his coming here and getting into the population of Yorkshire 500 years ago, it's quite likely that tens of thousands of people in Yorkshire have, an, have a shared ancestor who lives in, lived in Africa 500 years ago. So you don't have to go back all that far. But there is there's a lot of guesswork. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that, you know, as you know, um, Archbishop Usher gives the dates of Adam and Eve to be 4004 BC, October the 4th, 10.30 in the morning, it was a Thursday. Um, and it's kind of embarrassing for us atheists to realise that genetics kind of agrees with him. <laughs> well, I think that's a good moment to stop. Um, thank you very much indeed, Steve, for a really fascinating lecture and for um, honouring us with your presence here this evening. A pleasure. Thank you.